Welcome to the teaching ministry of Lifetime Guarantee. We've been presenting the message of freedom and grace in Christ for over 30 years. The legacy of the ministry spans every state in the U.S. and reaches into over 140 countries internationally. We're glad that by listening, you're joining the extended family of Lifetime Guarantee. Two things before we begin. First, after you've listened to this teaching, we encourage you to share this MP3 with your friends. Second, your financial contribution will assist us in making more of the ministry available to others. This is so important. You can make a donation at lifetime.org. That's lifetime.org. Just because food is present in my house doesn't mean that I live in a grocery store. And just because there is evil present in me doesn't mean that I'm evil. As a new creation in Christ, we long to serve and please God. However, we can be tempted to sin and act contrary to the new person we are. And on today's Lifetime Guarantee, we'll begin a series which discusses how you can gain greater victory over sin in your life. Welcome back to our program today, which features the teaching of Dr. Bill and Annabelle Gillum. I'm Mike Middleton, and today's program is on an aspect of the Christian life that you must understand if you're going to live the Christian life consistently. All Christians are tempted to sin, and because many fail to understand the dynamics of temptation, they fall victim to sin without an awareness of how to defeat it. If you've ever wondered why, as a new creation in Christ, you still sin, then this program will be insightful for you. It will also help you gain greater victory over sin as you learn to recognize the source of temptation. Here are Bill and Annabelle Gillum to explain. Well, today we're going to do a little role-playing to better illustrate some of the things we're going to be teaching today. Let's look in on the Sunday school class where Annabelle is teaching. As with anything she does, she's well prepared. You know by now that this is one of her flesh techniques for believing that she's loved, doing things perfectly. So she has perused the commentaries, checked the meanings of the words with her Strong's Concordance, read the scripture out of 26 versions of the New Testament, and, oh well, on with our story. It's several years ago. Well, our scripture this morning, gals, is from 1 Corinthians Chapter 10, verse 13, if you want to find it with me in your Bibles. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. What a promise. This verse, gals, is something we really need to stand on. It's something that's going to help us meet the temptations that come into our lives every day. Now, as we start, Paul was writing... Mrs. Gillum. Well, yes, Carol? That verse is not true. What? Um, What do you mean, honey? Last Thursday night, my best friend killed herself. She was one of the most dedicated Christians I had ever known. If that verse is true, why would she have killed herself? Um, <clears throat> well, I, uh, <clears throat> um... Well, so much for the well-prepared teacher. That point wasn't covered in the quarterly, in the commentaries, in the Strong's, or in Annabelle's personal walk with the Lord. Well, that little skit illustrates a truth that I think most of us fall into. We read the Word, we study the Word, and yet when it comes right down applying it to the crisis experiences in our lives, we fall short of that. Sometimes we do. You know, and Abe was so right. My preparation had just been fragmented. I didn't have an opinion. I didn't have a testimony. I was at a complete loss to answer this young woman, when she posed that question, I couldn't answer. And the more I thought about it, the more I was inclined to agree with her because most of the time, 
the verse didn't seem to work. So that night, I found myself asking for answers. I said, God, show me what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I'm confused. Well, I believe that God honored that petition. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that the Word of God is true. Right. But we've just illustrated with this little skit where many of us have been and where a lot of people still are. I know that that verse is true, but how to make it work in my life? Mm -hmm. Sometimes a lot of people are really puzzled by that. And God has shown us in this ministry how this verse works and how to get victory over these kinds of things. You know, more and more people are running into really tough sledding in the Christian life, and we believe firmly that this is the reason that God let you have experiences like that, Annabelle, back in that classroom 30 years ago where you crashed and burned in front of the class because he was equipping you to ultimately begin to share with the body of Christ these things that he has shown mm -hmm. us. Now, what we're going to be sharing is so simple. Yeah. And yet it is truth. And if you will listen and apply it to your walk with the Lord, you are going to experience victory over temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 will become real to you. You will understand what God's saying. And more than that, many of you will become equipped to explain to other people how they too can apply 1 Corinthians 10, 13 to overcome their unique struggles and versions of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to explain this verse, we're going to have to go back and begin with a few basic teachings. First of all, let's begin by exposing the devil, the deceiver, that power that seeks to control you even to the point of taking your own life on Thursday night, if possible. Let's look now how this thing works. Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, a very critical part of the Bible to understand if you're going to walk in victory on this planet. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, to paraphrase, the principle is this. There's something present in me that's evil. I know that I'm a new creature in Christ, I want to do good. I know the deep desire of my heart is to please God, for I joyfully agree with the law of God in the new inner man, who I really am. But I'm also aware of a different law, one that does not agree with his law, in the members of my body. It controls me. It enslaves me. There's conflict between the new creature that I am what I deeply desire to do, and this power, this entity that dwells in me, this evil that dwells in me. Paul, as he was writing this, considers our identity as new creations in Jesus just a basic fact, doesn't he? He says, the one who wishes to do good. Now, that's you and that's me, the one who wishes to do good. He says, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. Now, that I is the new creation. I, the new person that I am, I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. Now, that's the new man. And this evil present in us is not us. It's just like the tea said, just because food is present in my house doesn't mean that I live in a grocery store. Right. And just because evil is present in me doesn't mean that I'm evil. We are not evil. We are the one who wishes to do good. Paul also points out that the law of our mind is good. In his first letter to the church at Corinth, he wrote that we have the very mind of Christ 
1 Corinthians 2.16. What does that mean? I think it means, as I've studied it out before the Lord, not that we have his IQ, but that we have a brand new ability to understand God, to understand how to relate to him, understand spiritual truth. Uh, People who do not have regenerated spirits don't have that ability. They have a darkened mind, the scriptures say. And our darkened mind has been removed. That's right. We now have an enlightened mind. So we have the very mind of Christ. The veil has been lifted, Uh the scriptures say. So we see now that our mind is good, that the law of our mind is good. If this were not so, there would be no inner conflict, no war as Paul called it, because war demands that there be opposing factions. So in those verses, Romans 7, 21 through 23, these factions are evil versus good, the law of sin being evil and the law of our mind being good. You know, your mind has to be good now. It must reflect Uh, or represent God's kingdom, the kingdom of light, or there wouldn't be any war. That's right. You'd both be on the same side. You and the devil would be thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's got to represent God's kingdom. Now, the trick is how does this whole thing fit together? Because certainly I have thoughts in my mind that certainly don't represent God's kingdom, don't you? Yes. So those thoughts must be coming from somewhere besides my mind. Now, as you're listening, you will have to agree that you have a war going on inside your thought life. These thoughts fly fast and furious in there. Some of them are good. Some of them are not good. It's just critical that you understand who the principles are in this war. Now, the Bible says that your mind is one of the principles, and that's the good guy. And the Bible says that this power called sin is the other principle, and that's the bad guy. The power of sin represents the kingdom of darkness. Your mind represents the kingdom of light. And it's critical that you understand this if you're going to get victory over these thoughts that plague you all the time. Now, let me interject something here. Uh, The things that we're going to be sharing, some of you may have never heard before. Don't reject what we're saying. Just pray about it. Listen to it. Bill and I yearn to share this truth with you because it will give you such freedom in your walk with the Lord. It will give you such understanding of what this war is going on and why I continue to perform in a way that is uh, not pleasing to me, not pleasing to God. The scriptures would say it, why you do the very thing you do not wish. Now, this week we're going to continue elaborating on this and we're going to, by the grace of God, explain to you how you can get victory over these thoughts in your thought life that continue to plague you and result in your, quote, doing the very thing you do not wish. This week I was sitting in the airport by a group of Japanese tourists and of course they were chattering away in Japanese and uh, after sitting there about 15 minutes listening to their Japanese conversation, I began to be confused. I began to think, am I Japanese or am I American? I'm not really sure. I'm getting very insecure here. Now, that's an absurd illustration because, you know, (laughs) I can't speak Japanese. In fact, the longer they talked, the more I became aware of the fact, hey, I'm American. I'm not Japanese. I don't have any identity problem here. Now, that's speaking strictly in terms of planet Earth. Let's take it out of the context of strictly the nations and planet Earth and so forth. Let's look at it in the spiritual realm. Just as surely as I understand that I'm an American, I have got to understand who I am in the spiritual realm, or I am going to be buffeted by all of these thoughts in my mind, and I'm going to become very confused about my true identity. Who am I? 
because I certainly do experience some pretty grungy thoughts in my thought life. And if I believe those thoughts are really originating with me, those are really my thoughts, then I'm going to be very confused about whether I am one of the good guys or one of the bad guys in the kingdom. That is an excellent illustration. And just like you say, even though you sur were surrounded by these people who were talking in this language you couldn't understand, you were so secure in who you were that it didn't bother you. That's right. And if we can just be that secure in who we really are, then we can decipher these thoughts, these puzzling things that come to us. That's exactly right. In fact, this is the only way you're going to discern whether they're your thoughts or whether they're being fed to you. You can never, quote, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ as you're exhorted to in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 unless you have some criterion by which you can break out, well, which thoughts are mine and which thoughts are not coming from the Holy Spirit of God. Now, once again, before we get into our teaching here, let us just exhort you that this is one of the most vital truths that we can possibly share with you. Herein lies a major factor in whether you're going to walk in victory in your Christian walk or not. Boy, that's right. And if you were going to go to the grocery store and you're going to miss this, put it off for a few minutes. This is just dynamite. All right, let's establish now what God says in His Word about who you now are if you're new, a new creation, if you're born again. All right, first of all, you are a new creation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, or look, new things have come. The Scriptures say you are righteous. This is verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5. He made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin sin on our behalf. He made a sinner out of Jesus on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You are righteous now. Next, you are holy. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Listen. And that is what you are because you're a new creation now. You know, the thought just occurred to me. It's kind of after the fact. But 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where it said God made him to be sin who knew no sin, mm -hmm. that we might become the righteousness of God. What if Jesus had refused the role that God gave him of sinner as adamantly as we refuse the role of being righteous? Wow. He never could have made us righteous, and we certainly could never claim to be righteous mm -hmm. had, he, had he done that. That's right. We must claim what he did for us, or we limp along on just a portion of the grace of God that was accomplished through the finished work That's of Jesus so Christ. True. All right, God's Word says, you are blameless. This is Colossians 1, verse 22. He has now, look at that, now reconcile you in his fleshly body through death, that's Jesus, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Wow. But the problem is you don't always act that way, right? Like Paul, you don't always do what you wish to do. Now, this is Romans chapter 7, verse 19. Listen to how Paul says this. This is out of the New American Standard. The good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. Now, you can identify with that. Now, why, if we're new creations, how does that happen? How does that law of sin, which is present in your members, as the Scriptures say, cause you to end up doing the very thing you hate? 
I think a lot of us would relate with the woman who recently asked me the following question. In fact, I think if she had been a contemporary of Paul, that they would have talked for a long time over their coffee cups. Uh, this is what she said. I am so frustrated. I've done everything I know to do. I have prayed. I have studied my Bible. And my life is far from victorious. What do I do? Stand and stomp my foot at Satan and say no? That sounds like I'm taking on the devil myself, and I have the bloody wounds to prove that that just doesn't work. How does Christ live, as you say, in and through me? How will I be doing anything differently than what I'm trying so hard to do now? How can Satan so completely defeat and control me? I want things to be better. But at this point in time, I don't have much hope that they ever will be. Hmm. Boy, there's much more than hope for this lady, isn't there? There are answers, solid biblical answers. Praise God, yes. For every Christian. Answers that you and I can understand and apply to our everyday lives. Answers that will enable us to face Monday morning. Now, tune into this. This is dynamite if you don't understand it. And there are many, many Christians that are very confused about what Annabelle and I are going to be teaching right now. So trust the Holy Spirit and listen up. Romans chapters 5 through 8. The very heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ as taught by Paul contain the word sin 41 times. Now listen carefully. 40 of those times that word sin is a noun. Only once is it an action word, a verb. For instance, Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. Now, that word sin in that verse where it says don't present yourself to sin, that's a noun. But if you interpret it as a verb, for example, stealing, then you're going to miss a most powerful truth. Vine's expository dictionary of New Testament words is a powerful, uh, useful tool for every Christian. Your preacher has one. And it points out that in 11 instances, the word sin is, quote, a governing power or principle which is personified. That's on page 1055. Now, what does that mean? It means that this power called sin is able to somehow be represented as a personage. Romans 6, 13 that, we were, that I was just reading there a minute ago is not exhorting you not to sin. It's exhorting you not to submit to this power, this personification, this law called sin. So why? do we wind up doing the very thing we hate, the very thing we're exhorted not to do by submitting to this power? Well, answer, we're deceived. John called Satan the one who deceives the whole world in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. He is the deceiver, and he deceives us the new creations in Christ, the ones who really want to do good. The personified power of sin is merely the messenger boy who carries out Satan's battle strategy in this war being waged against the law of our minds. Okay, repeat that last statement now. All right. The personified power of sin is merely the messenger boy who carries out Satan's battle strategy in this war being waged against the law of our minds. Now, wrapping up then, today we've talked about a power which is in the body. Now, that's important. It's in your physical body. It doesn't mean your body's evil, but it's got this power in it. 
And this power is at war against your mind. Now, what is this power? Is it the old man? Well, it can't be because no. he was crucified with Christ. Right. Is it the devil? No, you don't have the devil dwelling in your body, although he certainly can influence us, can't he? Yes. All right, is it a demon? No, the Bible here is not talking about demonic activity, although that's very real also. But it's talking about a power called sin. Now, frankly, I'm not sure what that is, but I don't have to know what it is. All I have to know is it's not me. Now, that's the important thing. It's not me. So those thoughts that are coming to me from this power, I must have some sort of a strategy for warring against that power, or it is going to tube me out as a Christian. And we're seeing it happening all around us. Now, tomorrow, we're going to get into this and really teach how this power operates. So please try to be with us. Yesterday, as we ran out of time, we were discussing the war that every Christian has within. Now, in this particular war inside your mind, we were discussing that you're fighting against something called the power of sin. Now, that power of sin is not the devil himself. It's not a demon. It's not the old man because he got crucified. It's not the sin nature. That's synonymous with the old man. It's something called the power of sin. Now, that's Romans chapter 7. Verses 21 through 23. That's right. Now, I'm not real sure exactly what that is. I think it's Satan's counterfeit of the Holy Spirit, but I'm not really sure. But what I am sure of scripturally is that it's not the Christian. It's a power that is somehow connected to Satan's kingdom that wars against your sound mind. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to repeat something that I said yesterday as we start. This personified power of sin is the messenger boy who carries out Satan's battle strategy in this war that's being waged against the law of our minds, the good law of our minds. And here's how he does it. Satan's game plan hinges on deception, and he has a single goal. That goal is to keep us from experiencing the life that is ours in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, his goal is to prevent us at any cost from realizing true peace and victory, this peace and victory that have been provided for us by God through Jesus Christ. Now, for example, Bill and I have shared with you some facts. Now, facts, if you look it up, is labeled or the de definition is indisputable evidence. And so we've shared some facts with you from God's Word concerning your true identity, who you are, and the power of Christ which lives within you. Now, we've told you that these facts will literally revolutionize your life if you'll appropriate them. But Satan doesn't want you to appropriate them. He doesn't want you to walk in these truths because they'll bring you peace and joy and victory into your life. So he wars against the law of your mind, and he does this through your thought life. Satan's access to your thought life is through this power of sin in the members of your body, literally your flesh and bone, and he operates by giving you thoughts. Now listen carefully. Thoughts generally with first person singular pronouns. Like what? I, me, my, myself, mine. Okay, let's kick around some examples of thoughts that Christians might receive from this power called sin with first person singular pronouns. Okay, I'll give the first one. How about this one? My husband doesn't have any right to say that to me. Okay, now here's a suicidal one. They'd all be better off if I were gone. Now look at those pronouns, Christian. 
Okay. I, it's like it's your own thought. Here's one that might come to you when you're just about at your emotional end and your wit's end. If that baby doesn't stop screaming, I'm going to put a pillow over his face. And here's one coming out of a, a low self-esteem. I hate myself. I literally despise myself. Here's one that would be very familiar to some businessmen. I'm not paid near enough as it is, so uh, just padding my expense account a little bit with this hotel bill isn't going to matter that much. Here's a guy with a sexual temptation. Man, I'd like to bed that. I. And here's one that is rampant today. I'm going to leave my wife. We don't have anything in common anymore. Why keep trying? You may or may not be able to identify with one of these illustrations that we just used because, see, you're going to buy into your own unique temptations, and I'm going to buy into my own unique temptations. So I'll tell you what, why don't uh, the three of us, Mike, turn your mic on there. Okay. Why don't the three of us talk about thoughts that we experience in our own walk that are coming from the power of indwelling sin. You go now, first. I, well, I think ladies first. Don't you mind? <laughs> I mean, that's only a that's, Oh, that's gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine, after getting married, you know, you can build in new thinking patterns after different crisis experiences. And in my marriage, uh, these thoughts would be very familiar to me. I never, never do anything right. Or, I am such a blah, unlikable person. I hate myself. Or, I can't do it. I just simply cannot do it. I cannot go on. Okay, how about you, Mike? Well, my... Uh uh, unique temptation uh, is uh, probably lies in different areas. So some of the common thoughts I would receive would be like this. My career isn't going along as quickly as I'd like, so I'll just find another job where I can really move up the ladder. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's another one. I'd really like to have him as my friend, so I'll just impress him with my achievements and my humor so he'll like me. Or... My car's really racking up the miles, and I sure hate to think about all the mechanical problems I'm going to have, so I'll just go buy a new one. Now it's your turn. Okay. Mine would be more like this. I am one of the neatest people that I know. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. Hey, I did that, gang, just to get their reaction. <laughs> okay. Now, I would get thoughts like this, um, the sexual thing. Man, what a body. Or something like this. I don't feel like doing that today. I think I'll just wait till tomorrow kind of a lazy thought or um, this beat on myself memory kind of a thought oh if only I had done that differently or this envious kind of thought I don't have a quick mind I wish I could organize my thoughts like he does now these are the kinds of thoughts that we experience the three of us Maybe, again, you can't identify with that at all. But the evil one will serve these thoughts up to you through the power of sin according to your own particular temptations. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have a biblical foundation for that? Yeah, I think the clearest is out of Romans chapter 7 where Paul is talking about his struggle against this power called sin. Now, I'm going to read verse 15 and I want you to count the number of actors in this verse. As I was struggling as a Christian counselor in the late 70s, God showed me this, and I tell you, it is revolutionary. All right, here we go. For that which I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. 
Now, we can all identify with that verse, and there are nine eyes in there, one actor. Now, let's go on down to verse 20. Count the actors in this verse. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now, that's talking about that power called sin. That word is a noun there. Sin somehow is doing this thing. Now, I am not heading for the devil made me do it in no way. But I am heading for this power is involved when a Christian sins. And I want to know how this power is involved. And as I took this to the Lord, I said, Sir, there are two actors in verse 20, I plus the power of sin. And there's only one actor in verse 15, I. Yet I know the power of sins in verse 15 because the power of sin came in at the fall. Now, how did the power of sin go low profile, go underground in verse 15? And this is where God gave me this insight that the power of indwelling sin wars against my mind with first-person singular pronouns. That's why all those eyes are in there, up there in verse 15. Half of those eyes, I never have counted them, but some of those eyes up there are the power of sin dialoguing with this man's mind in Scripture. Now, he'll do exactly that same thing with you. And you notice I say he because the Scriptures personify that power. It's personified right there in Romans 7, verse 20. It says that sin which dwells in me, that's a personification of that power that dwells in you and it wars against your sound mind, as we have been looking at in Romans 7, 21 through uh, 23. Now, Christian, if you don't know this, you will go merrily along your way and many, many of the thoughts that you're going to experience all day long are going to be coming at you from that power. Now, do you see that? And do you see that your only hope of victory is to be able to accurately break out which thoughts are coming from that power and which thoughts you're generating with your sound mind, the mind of Christ. So be sure and tune back in tomorrow as we continue to discuss this so you can understand how to get victory over the power of sin. We're talking about how the power of sin wars against the law of our minds and if we're not aware of what's happening, he controls us. And we wind up, as Paul says in Romans 7, doing the very thing we don't want to do. Now, you said the law of sin, and then you called it he. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Well, it's personified. As we've been teaching, this word sin is given 41 times in Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. And 40 of those times, it is presented as a noun. Eleven of those times, it is personified. This is a power. It is something that communicates with us. Now, what we're trying to do is to make you aware of how this power of sin communicates with you and how this power of sin can control you. You see, Satan controls this power of sin, and he wants to defeat us. He wants to keep us from walking in the beautiful provision of victory that God has given us through mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's his game plan for us, and he does it uniquely in your life, and he does it uni uniquely in mine. And if we aren't aware of his game plan that he has, he can easily convince you of anything even suicide, as we've been mentioning. He can convince you that the old you wasn't really crucified with Christ at all or that that old you has come back to life again. For instance, these thoughts. 
Why, I'm not a new person. I'm not a new creation. I only have to look at all the garbage in my life to know that. That's ridiculous, a new creation. Why, I don't even read my Bible that much. I'm not good at my job. I don't do anything right. I'm not a good wife. I'm more of an embarrassment to my family and to God than than anything else. Everyone would be better off without me. Now then, examine those statements carefully. Do you see the pronouns? I, me, and my. These are not your thoughts. A new creation, one with the very mind of Christ, does not, indeed cannot, generate such thoughts. Whoa, now wait a minute. Cannot generate such thoughts. Now, that's something that when I first began to see that, it triggered off in my mind a verse that has always been very puzzling to me up until the time that I saw this. And that verse is in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. Now, here's the part I couldn't understand. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. And that's puzzling. Now, wouldn't you have to say that? Yes. All right. I think that God has shown me the answer to that. It isn't that the new man cannot sin because I'm a new man and I certainly sin. And every person, every Christian does sin. The scriptures say in 1 John, if we say that we have no sin, you know, we're lying. We're, we're liars. So what does it mean? It means that you don't generate sin. The new man doesn't originate rebellious against God thinking in his mind because he now has the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. Well, then why do we sin? Because we get these thoughts served up to our sound mind by this power called the power of sin. And that power of sin serves those thoughts up with first-person singular pronouns. And you will think for all the world that they are your own thoughts. Uh huh. Now then, the old self is dead. Romans 6.6 6 says this, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Now then, ask the question, why? That our body of sin might be done away with. Why? That we should no longer be slaves to sin. And verse that's, 7. That's, that's a power. That's mm -hmm. sin. That's a noun. Right. And then verse 7 says, For he who has died is free from sin. And that's that power again. Uh -huh. That's that noun. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm free from ever receiving thoughts. It means that I am free from having to be controlled. And this is what people are crying out for, just like the lady that we read the question from in our very first session. She said, how can Satan so control me and defeat me? Mm -hmm. Now, here's how he does it. He gives you first person singular pronoun thoughts and they're so familiar to you that you accept them as your own thoughts and follow through on them but now galatians 2 20 says i have been crucified with christ and i myself no longer live okay. christ whoa i want to i want to uh add some clarification here okay you read the verse and i'm going to talk about what died all right start over again I have been crucified with Christ. All right. Now, is that the new you or the old you? That's the old you. That's the Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified. That's right. Okay, go ahead. I have been crucified with Christ, and I myself no longer live. Now, that's the old you, because you're certainly alive. There you are uh -huh. standing over there. Christ lives in me. Uh-huh. Now, and who does Christ live in? The new guy or the old guy? The new creation. The new creation. Uh -huh. And the life that I now live. Now, who's the I there? The new creation. Who you are. Uh -huh. Okay. In the flesh. Yes. I live by faith in the Son of God. Now, who's this I? 
This is the new creation. That's right. Mm -hmm. So there really are two people, you might say, in Galatians two twenty. Mm -hmm. The old self and the new creation. That's right. Uh huh. All right. Now then. If you will just accept that, you will see that you are not fighting a civil war, the good you against the bad you. That's right. It's the righteousness of God, the new creation, against the power of sin, waging war against the law of your mind and making you a prisoner of the law of sin or the power of sin, which is in your members. That's right. You know, Jesus said about Satan's kingdom, any kingdom or household divided against itself cannot stand. Now, can we take that same teaching and generalize it to the house of God? Of course. And that means that if you, Annabelle, are a house divided against yourself, then Jesus himself said, you'll never hack it I'm on this planet. You, you're doomed. No you'll hope. never make it. Mm -hmm. So forget about victory over Monday morning in your life. Forget about victory over depression and suicidal thinking. Forget all that stuff because you're never going to hack it because you're a house divided. People that cannot be true. You are not a house divided. You are a righteous new creation in Christ. These thoughts that make you think you're a house divided are actually being served up to your sound mind by this power called sin that's in your members. So, if we are not responsible for generating these thoughts from th that are served up to us by the power of sin, then where does accountability come in? Where are we responsible? The scriptures say, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That's Romans chapter 6, verse 12. And that sin is not sinning. Don't let sinning reign. It says don't let this power control you. So it's all in the letting. Now, Annabelle, where is your do not letter? It's my will. That's right. And you are absolutely on the hook. You're responsible for choosing to not let that power control you. You choose with your free will to accept the thoughts submitted by this power of sin as though they were your own thoughts. And then and only then do they become your own thoughts. Once you receive them and make them yours, you're entirely responsible for sinning in your thought life. And if you ponder these thoughts and entertain them at the conscious level for a long enough period of time, they're invariably going to influence your freedom of choice. You're going to choose to behave in response to those thoughts, and you'll wind up, as the scriptures say, doing the very thing you don't want to do in the first place. You wind up sinning. Let me encourage you to just accept these thoughts as yours as I voice a prayer here for all of us. Dear Father, I think that I have heard the answer. I think that I'm beginning to see some things. I have been defeated for so long. I have been walking in discouragement, despair. I haven't been performing the way I want to perform, and I believe that I'm beginning to hear. Lord, show me. I want so badly to know. I want so desperately to know how to walk in victory, how to accept everything that you've given me and you've provided for me. So, dear Father, I thank you for what I've heard, and I'm trusting you to teach me, to give me further insight that I might become everything that you have made provision for me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome back to Lifetime Guarantee with teachers and authors Dr. Bill and Annabelle Gillum. The Gillums present their victorious Christian Living Seminar all across the country, and their books have ministered to thousands looking for answers about the Christian life. 
They come your way each day on this program to share with you from their many years of ministry to the body of Christ. And today they're joined by Preston Gillum, the Executive Vice President of our ministry, for our roundtable question and answer session. I'm Mike Middleton, and this week we've been discussing temptation and how it works in the life of the believer. Understanding how and why we're tempted to sin is a crucial factor in becoming victorious over sin. So you'll want to listen closely today as we discuss these topics. Our first question today has to do with an area of our teaching that I think may be confusing for a lot of people, so you may relate to this question. Listen closely. It goes like this. Your theory that Satan will speak to me with first-person singular pronouns could be very liberating, but can you document this in Scripture? I think it would be good to use, even if you can't document it, but I'd like to have a biblical foundation. Well, I commend you for that. It's a wise person. Mm -hmm. There are so many Christians, they'll hear something that sounds exciting, and they'll say, wow, yeah, and just swallow it. Right. And boy, I commend you. You ought to hold every teacher's feet to the fire and test everything a teacher says against the Word of God and the inner witness of the Spirit. So I commend you for that. Now, but I'm really offended by it, nevertheless. <laughs> but she wouldn't just take what we say for yeah. granted, you know? Yeah. <laughs> After all, we are on the radio. That's right. All right. Now, out of Romans chapter 7, verse 15, uh, I want you to notice the number of actors in this verse. For that which I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Obviously, one actor. And yet, we know that the power of sin is involved in this man's life somewhere. Now, verse 20 documents this. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Sin, this power, must have been communicating with this man in first-person singular pronouns for him to fail to recognize this power that's involved in his sinning. You can see two actors here in verse 20, but only one in verse 15. And this is where we first began to see that the power of sin, which is Satan's agent that indwells the Christian, wars against your mind with first-person singular pronouns. Look down in verse 23. I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind. And it's talking about this law of sin. So if that war is going on in your mind, I want to ask you a question. Do you experience second person singular pronouns in your personal war? Do, does some thought come to you, why don't you give her a piece of your mind? You don't get that. The thoughts you get are, I'm just going to give her a piece of my mind. This war is carried on with first-person singular pronouns. You know, I also, just to kind of go along with what you're talking about there in Romans 7, I think Paul sets the stage for this principle there that he's going to be talking about with the example that he begins to give in his own life with regard to coveting. This is along about verse 7 or so. He says, I wouldn't have known that coveting was wrong if the law hadn't said, Thou shalt not covet. I think that it is no accident that he chose that particular Ten Commandment to reference because that's the only one of the commandments that was a sin of the heart, so to speak, an internal sin. So he sets the stage here for the law of sin to be able to work within here. And then he elaborates on it in the verses that you've been talking about there with the first person pronouns so that what we would describe as sinful behavior here actually happens all within Paul. You couldn't stand from afar and say, oh, look, he's coveting. It could all be internalized, mm -hmm. and so he could show this war from within. Mm -hmm. Good point. Here's our next question. You say that all sin is made up of component parts, but what about anger? It just seems to surface at the point of confrontation. I can't see that there are steps that lead to an angry retort. I have this problem and need help. Uh, let me start on that one, Mike, by saying this. Perhaps you have just taken the situation and analyzed it where you give the angry retort. Well, 
you need to analyze the situations that led up to it maybe all day long because your emotions escalate all day long. I would dare say that there are times when the very exact same thing can happen and you don't give an angry retort. In other words, there are times when you are emotionally high-strung and you aren't emotionally high-strung and you can handle it better than at other times. And so it doesn't have to relate to the problem. A pattern that is developed through the years, let's say, for instance, like a child who needles or wheedles his mother where he says, Why, mother? Please, mother. No, not today, David. Well, I haven't been to Mark's house in three days. No, not today, David. Please, mother. And then she finally blows, and she says, no. All right, now then. At that point, his mother may blow and say, I said no. She gives an angry retort. Well, it has built then over these few seconds there, and you see why the angry retort is there. But go back and analyze all day long, Mm -hmm. and just little things will happen all day long until finally you blow. Mm -hmm. And there are steps that lead. You're in a state of blowing. You may blow for uh, several minutes at at everybody who comes along Uh with with, uh, a problem. We excuse it by saying, well, it was just the straw that broke the camel's back, something like that. If we analyze that, we say, yes, the straws have been building on the camel's back all day long, and they do. But along with what you're saying now, there are certain people, and the straws seem to have been building on the camel's back for their entire lives. And so they just stay up there near the top of their tolerance scale. Let's say their emotions, uh, we can represent it on a 1 to 10 scale. So we would say that their emotions are what we call the feeler. Their feeler is stuck at a 9. It's been at a 9 with feeling hostile, just feeling hostile, hostility at 9. And they just stay there. So they only have one point of tolerance for anger before they blow, we'll say. Well, how much of a, a stimulus situation would be required for them to go from 9 to 10? Very little. Minor. Yeah, and so they would claim, well, I've just got a short fuse. But actually, that's not really true. Their feet are stuck, and the Holy Spirit is the one who can provide the lubrication to get that threshold back down to where this person can have more points of flexibility on his emotion scale. Okay, here's our next question. What part do my own mind and logic and ability to think things through play in this temptation process? You say I will receive thoughts from the power of sin and from the Holy Spirit. Don't I have a responsibility in there somewhere? That's a good question, Mike. You know, there are actually three entities that are communicating in here. You've identified two of them, the Spirit and the law of sin, but you are in there as well. That's right. There are three entities, and the law of sin will be working against you and the Spirit. You are a new creation. You want to do what God wants you to do. And so you are following and agreeing with the Spirit. The law of sin then is trying to undermine that and trying to create this rebellion and so on that we would would call an act of sin. That's right. Press, let me ask you a question now. Uh, Let's take your particular mind do you have a preference of a certain color, for example? Yeah, yeah. And now, is that the spirit, or is that the law of sin, or is that just press's preference? That's my preference. Yeah, sure. there's there's a real simple illustration of it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, I'm not a non-entity in this deal at all. I'm not a hollow tube that Jesus sometimes pours through, and that sin sometimes pours through. Right. God has given me a personality. He created me in his image and so on. Furthermore, he says, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, that I have the mind of Christ, meaning that he has regenerated my mind. Now, I can reason. I can have thoughts with that mind. I can equate things and weigh things and so on. Furthermore, over in 2 Timothy, Paul says that uh, we have a sound mind. 
and that this is something that I can depend upon in a sense through the power of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So I'm very involved, integrally involved with this whole process, I think. Mm -hmm. It's a process of learning, too. Let's say, just taking an example, let's say that you didn't become a Christian until you were 17. And you really had no knowledge of the Bible. You were uh, not familiar with uh, Christianity in any way. You led a very promiscuous life sexually up until 17. Then you become a Christian. And now then, you are going to begin hearing things, putting new things in your mind. You're going to read in the instruction book here, the Bible, that it says flee immorality. Now then, that's a new process in your mind. That's a new uh, standard that's in your mind that wasn't there before. And so you definitely have a part. You learn, you study, uh, you pursue different things. And then when the power of sin gives you a thought and the Holy Spirit gives you a thought, you with your sound mind can take these thoughts and you can rightly divide what's happened, what what these thoughts are that are coming and how you should lean. But you won't know that unless you prepare for it, unless you study. And this is where your mind comes in. You are building your arsenal of weapons every time you read the Word and you put new thoughts and new standards, godly standards, in your arsenal. You know, the Word says that you are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit is to take every thought captive. You're to do that, and you do that with your mind and your will. We hope you've been encouraged by the teaching ministry of Lifetime Guarantee. You can find similar resources, messages, and articles at lifetime.org. We have a wealth of information on marriage, parenting, depression, overeating, freedom and identity in Christ, as well as men's and women's issues. You'll find a complete catalog at lifetime.org. Two quick reminders before we conclude. Feel free to share this MP3 with others, especially those you know who might need it. Do so with our encouragement and blessing. And we would sincerely appreciate your financial assistance in making the ministry available to more people. Just go to lifetime.org and you'll find a secure way to support Lifetime Guarantee on the homepage. And finally, we pray God's blessings for you.